Times Square Water Music. By way of a leak in the brickwork, beside a stairway in the Times Square subway, midway between the IR and the BMT, weeks of sneaking seepage had smuggled in that morning a centimeter of standing water. To ward off the herd we tend to turn into, turned loose on the tiered terrain of the Times Square subway, somebody had tried with a half-hearted barricade or tether of twine to cordon off the stairway, as though anyone could tie up seepage into a package, down which the water, a dripping escapee, was surreptitiously proceeding with the intent, albeit inadvertent, in time at an inferior level to make a lake. Having gone round the pond thus far accumulated, bound for the third infra-infernal hollow of the underground, where the N, R, R, and Q, B cars are wont to travel, in mid-descent I stopped, abruptly waylaid by a sound. Alongside the iron-rung nethermost stairway, under the banister, a hurrying skein of moisture had begun on its way down to unravel into the trickle of a musical, minuscule waterfall. Think of spleenwort, of moss and maidenhair fernwort. Think of water pipples, of oozles and wagtails dipping into the course of it as the music of it oozes from the walls. Think of it undermining the computer's cheap, the time clock's hiccup, the tectonic inchings of it towards some general crack-up. Think of it. Think of water running, running, running till it falls. A procession of candles. Moving on or going back to where you came from, bad news is what you mainly travel with. A breakup or a breakdown, someone running off or walking out, called up or called home, death in the family. Nudged from their stanchions outside the terminal, anonymous of purpose as a flock of birds, the bison of the highway funnel westward onto Route 80, mirroring an entity that cannot look into itself and know what makes it what it is. Sooner or later, every trek becomes a funeral procession. The mother curtained in intensive care. A scene the mind leaves blank, fleeing instead toward scenes of transhumance, the belled sheep moving up the Pyrenees, red tasseled pack llamas footing velvet green precipices, the Kurdish women jingling with bangles, gorgeous on their rug piled mounts. Already lying dead, Bereavement altering the moving lights to a processional, a feast of candlemas. Change as childbearing, birth as a kind of shucking off. Out of what began as a mosaic insult, such a loathing of the common origin, even a virgin having given birth needs purifying, to carry fire as though it were a flower, the terror and the loveliness entrusted into naked hands, supposing God might have, might actually need a mother. People have, at times, found this a way of being happy. A candlemas of moving lights along Route 80, lighted candles in a corridor from Arlington over the Potomac, for every carried flame the name of a dead soldier, an element fragile as ego, frightening as parturition, necessary and intractable as dreaming. The lapped, wheel-borne integument, layer within layer, at the core a dream of something precious, ripped. Where are we? The sleepers groan, stir, re-wrap themselves about the self's imponderable substance, or clamber down, numb-footed, half in a drowse, a freezing dark, through a stonehenge of fuel pumps, the bison hulks slantwise beside them, drinking. What is real except what's fabricated? The jellies glitter, cream-capped in the cafeteria showcase, Gumball groves, lifesavers, cinctured in parcel gilt, plop from their housings, perfect like miracles. Comb, nail clipper, lip rouge, mirrors and emollients, embody, niched into the washroom wall case, the pristine seductiveness of money. Absently, without inhabitants, this nowhere oasis wears the place name of Indian Meadow. The westward trekking transhumance once only of a people who, in losing everything they had, lost even the names they went by, stumbling past like caribou, perhaps camped here. Who can assign a trade-in value to that sorrow? The monk in sheepskin 
over tucked up saffron, intoning to a drum, becomes the metronome of one more straggle up Pennsylvania Avenue in falling snow, a whirl of tenderly remorseless corpuscles, street gangs amuck among magnolia's pregnant wands, a stillness at the heart of so much whirling. Beyond the torn integument of childbirth, sometimes wrapped like a papoose into a grief not merely of the ego, you rediscover almost the rest in peace of the placental coracle. Of what the dead were, living, one knows so little as barely to recognize the fabric of the backward ramifying antecedents, half-noted presences in darkened rooms, the old, the feared, the hallowed. Never the same river drowns the unalterable dorsal. An effigy in olive wood or pear wood, dank with the sweat of age, walled in the dark at Brauron, Argos, Samos. Even the unwed Athena, who had no mother, born, it's declared, of some man's brain, like every other pure idea, had her own wizened cult object, kept out of sight like the incontinent whimperer in the backstairs bedroom, where no child ever goes. To whom, year after year, the fair linen of the sacred peplos was brought in ceremonial procession, flutes and stringed instruments, wildflower-hung cattle, nubile Athenian girls, young men, praised for the beauty of their bodies. Who can unpeel the layers of that seasonal returning to the dark where memory fails as birds re-enter the ancestral flyway? Daylight, snow falling, knotting of gears, Chicago. Soot, the rotting backsides of tenements, grime troll shapes of ice underneath the bridges, the tunnel heaving like a birth canal. Disgorged, the infant howling in the restroom, steam table cereal, pale coffee, wall-eyed TV receivers, armchairs of molded plastic. The squalor of the day resumed, the orphaned litter taken up again unloved, the spawn of botched intentions, grief a mere hardening of the gut, a set piece of what can't be avoided. Parents by the tens of thousands, living unthanked, unpaid, but in the sour coin of resentment. Mid-morning, gray as zinc along Route 80, corn stubble quilting the underside of snowdrifts, the cadaverous belvedere of windmills, the sullen stare of feedlot cattle, black creeks puncturing white terrain, the frozen bottom land a mush of willow tops, drag netted in ice, the Mississippi. Westward toward the dark, the undertow of scenes come back to, fright riddling the structures of interior history. Where is it? Where in the shucked off bundle, the hampered obscurity that has been for centuries the mumbling lot of women? Did the thread of fire, too frail ever to discover what it meant, to risk even the taking of a shape, relinquish the seed of possibility, unguessed at as a dream of something precious. Memory, that exquisite blunderer, stumbling like a migrant bird that finds the flyway it hardly knew it knew except by instinct, down the long unentered nave of childhood, late on a midwinter afternoon, alone among the snow-hung hollows of the windbreak on the far side of the orchard, encounters, sheltering among the evergreens, a small, stilled, bird, its cap of clear yellow slit by a thread of scarlet, the untouched nucleus of fire, the lost connection hallowing the wizened effigy, the mother curtained in intensive care, a candlemas of moving lights along Route 80, at nightfall and falling snow, the stillness and the sorrow of things moving back to where they came from. Gooseberry Fool. The gooseberry's no doubt an oddity, an outlaw or pariah even, thorny and tart as any kindergarten martinet. It can harbor like a fern seed on its leaves underside, bad news for pine trees, for as the spruce resists the blister rust it's host to. That veiny Chinese lantern, its solid jelly of a fruit, not only has no aroma, but is twice as tedious as the wild strawberry's sunburst stem end appendage each one must be between nails snipped at both extremities. Altogether, gooseberry virtues take some getting used to, much as does tripin, tripe la mode de quin, or having turned 13. The acerbity of all things green and adolescent lingers in it. The arrogant, shrinking, prickling in every direction, thorniness that loves no company except its, or anyhow that's what it gets, Bristling up through gooseberry ghetto sprawl are brace thistles, silvery, militantly symmetrical defense machineries. 
Likewise, inseparably entangled in the disarray of an uncultivated childhood where gooseberry bushes, since rooted out, once flourished, is the squandered volupte of lemon-yellow-petaled roses, luscious flim-flam, an inkling of the mingling into one experience of suave and sharp, whose supremely improbable and far-fetched culinary embodiment is a gooseberry pool. Tomorrow, having stumbled into this trove of chief ingredients, the other being very thickest cream, I'll demonstrate it for you. Ever since four summers ago, I brought you a gleeful aerial, the trophy of a small, sour handful. I've wondered what not quite articulated thing could render magical the green globe of an unripe berry. I think now it was simply the great globe itself too much to carry. what the light was like. Every year in June, up here, that's a month for lilacs, almost his whole front yard, with lobster traps stacked out in back, atop the rise that overlooks the inlet, would be a Himalayan range of peaks of bloom, white or mauve violet, gusting a turbulence of perfume. And every year, the same iridescent hummingbird, or its descendant, would be at work among the morning cloaks and swallowtails, its motor loud, its burning gorget darkening at moments as though charred. He kept an eye out for it, we learned one evening, as for everything that flapped or hopped or hovered crepuscular under the firs. He'd heard the legendary trilling of the woodcock and watched the eiders, once rare along these coasts, making their comeback so that now they're everywhere, in tribes, in families of aunts and cousins, a knitted pearl of irresistibly downy young behind them, riding every cove and inlet. And yes, in answer to the question summer people always ask, he'd seen the puffins that breed out on Titmanan, in summer improbably clown-faced behind the striped scarlet of Commedia del Arte masks we'll never see except in Roger Torrey Peterson's field guide or childish wishful thinking. There was much else I meant to ask about another summer, but in June, when we came limping up here again, looking forward to easing up from mean, hard, unaccommodating winter, we heard how he'd gone out at dawn, one morning in October, unmoored the dinghy and rowed his boat as usual, the harbor already chugging with half a dozen neighbors' revved up craft, wet decks stacked abaft with traps, the bait and keg stowed forward, a lifting weft of fog spooled off in pearl pink fleeces overhead with the first daylight, and steered, as usual, past first the inner and then the outer bar, where in whatever kind of weather the red reef bell yells in that interminable treble, trouble, out past where the groaner lolls, its tempo and forte changing with the chop, played on by every wind shift, straight into the sunrise, a surge of burning, turning the whole ocean iridescent fool's gold over molten emerald, into the core of that day-after-day day amazement, a clue, one must suppose, to why lobstermen are often naturally gracious. Maybe, out there beside the wheel, the Baptist spire shrunk to a compass point, the town an interrupted circlet, feeble as an apron string for all the labor it took to put it there. It's finding out in that ungirdled wallowing and glitter, finally, that what you love most is the same as what you're most afraid of. God, in a word. For as it seems, they think they've got it licked, or used to, back there in the restricted area, for instance, where that huge hush-hush thing they say is radar sits sprawling on the heath like Stonehenge, belittling every other man-made thing in view, even the gargantuan pods of the new boat hulls you now and then see lying stark naked, crimson on the inside as a just-skinned carcass in Young's boatyard. Even the gray grange hall, wood heated by a yard arm of a stovepipe across the ceiling. Out there, from that wallowing perspective, all comparisons amount to nothing. Though once you hauled your last trap, things tend to wander into shorter focus as, around noon, you head back in. First at Manan Lighthouse, a ghostly gimlet on its ledge by day, but on clear nights expanding to a shout to starboard. The sunstruck rock pile of Cranberry Point to port. Then you see the hamlet, rainbowed above the blurring of the spray shield by the hurrying herring gull's insatiable fandango of excitement. The spire first, then the crimson boat hulls, the struts of the ill-natured gadget on the heath behind them as the face of things expands, the hide-and-seek behind the velvet-shouldered sparse tree-spine profiles, as first the outer, then the inner bar appears, then the scree beach under Crowley Island's crowding firs and spruces, and you detect 
among the chimneys and the TV aerials, yours. But by mid-afternoon of that October day, when all his neighbors' boats had chugged back through the inlet, his was still out. At evening, with half the town out looking and a hard frost settling in among the alders, there had been no sign of him. The next day and the next, the search went on and widened, joined by planes and helicopters from as far away as Boston. When on the third day his craft was sighted finally, it had drifted with its engine running till the last gulp of fuel spluttered and ran out beyond the town's own speckled noose of buoys, past the furred crest of Scudic, vivid in a skirt of aspens, the boglands cranberry crimson at its foot, past the bald brow the sunrise always strikes first of the hulk of Cadillac, riding the current effortlessly as eiders tied to water by the summer moat, for fifty miles southwestward to wear off Matinicus, out past the rock that, like Titmanon, is the restricted area, off limits for all purposes but puffins, they spotted him, slumped against the kegs. I find it tempting to imagine what, when the blood roared, overflowing its cerebral sluice way, and the iridescence of his last perception, charring, gave way to unreversed, irrevocable dark. The light out there was light. It's always shifting, from a nimbus gone berserk to a single gorget, a cathedral train of blinking, or the fog-bound shroud that can turn anywhere into a nowhere. But it's useless. Among the morning cloak hovered over lilac peaks, their whites and purples when we pass his yard, poignant to excess with fragrance, this year we haven't seen the hummingbird. Voyages. On April 27, 1932, Hart Crane walked to the taffrail of the Orisaba, took off his coat, and leaped. At 17, a changeling from among the tire and rubber factories, steel mills, cornfields of the Ohio flatland that had absentmindedly produced him, on an enthralled first voyage, he'd looked into the troughed Caribbean and called it home. Back where he'd never been at home, He'd once watched the early morning shift pour down South Main, immigrant Greeks eager to be Americans, and then tried to imagine Porphyro in Akron, Greek for high place, the casement, the arras, the fabricated love nest, the actual sleet storm, the owl, the limping hair, the frozen grass, Keats's own recurring dream of being warm, who'd been so often cold he looked with yearning even into blacksmith's fires. How glorious, he wrote of them, shivering with Stevens to see the stars put on their glittering belts. Of what disaster was that chill, was that salt wind the imminence? The cold, a long time, lifetime snowman did not know. Beside the Neva, Asip Mandelstam wrote of the cold, the December fog blurs of Leningrad. Oh, to throw open, he wrote, a window on the Adriatic, a window for the deprived of audience, for the unfree to breathe, to breathe even the bad air of Moscow. Yet on the freezing pain of perpetuity, that coruscating cold frame fernery of breath, harsh flower bed of the unheated rooms of childhood, even from the obscurity that sealed it off, his breath, his warmth, he dared declare, had already settled. The dream of being warm, its tattered cargo brought too late to Italy, a mere dire fistful of blood the sea had soaked his heart through. The voyage, every voyage at the end, is cruel. In February 1937, from exile to flatland Voronezh, a kind of twin of Akron, Mandelstam wrote in an almost posthumous whisper of round blue bays, of sails descried, scenes parted from as now his voyage to the bottom of a crueler obscurity began, whose end only the false-haired seaweed of an inland shipwreck would register. Untaken voyages, lethe and cold, oh, all but unendured arrivals, Keats's starved stare before the actual, so long imagined, Bay of Naples, the mine's extinction, night long, sleepless beside the Spanish steps, the prattle of poured water, letters no one will ever open. Margaret Fuller, 1847. In this, her 37th year, the Italy she discerned already smoldering through some queer geological contortion beneath a new world crust abruptly ceased to be a metaphor. She was in Rome, and from her lodgings on the Corso, she watched as things began to happen. 
the torch-lit procession to the Quirinal, the flung-out embrace of Pio Nono from his balcony, seeming, at least, to give the upheaval in the streets his blessing. By September, in Florence, in Milan, more demonstrations. That second spring she'd once despaired of, the colonel lying dormant in the husk no longer, the shattered chrysalis, the tidal concourse in the streets and through the bloodstream, one and the same. Angelo Ossoli, whom she'd met by chance, the faintly scandalous perennial adventure that awaits a woman of whatever age or status in such a place, was now her lover. Without the cause he'd drawn her into, a mutilated Italy made whole, at peace within, left to itself at last, the hated foreign uniforms gone home. She'd once again have kept her head, perhaps, remained unconscionably chaste, seen the admirer she'd somehow led on, pulled back bewildered, as her self-esteem gone numb, she worked at being noble. Not now, not in this place. The furnace that had scathed her solitude, burned with the torches, glowed in the votive banks lit by the faithful. The two of them went frequently to Mass, on long excursions into the countryside, inhaled the reek of grapes still on the vine, observed the harvest. The violets and roses that still bloomed made her bedroom sweet all through November. I have not been so well, she wrote her mother, since I was a child, nor so happy ever. Nor so happy ever. Short of money, she lived now in one room, on fruit, bread, a little wine, saw a few acquaintances, dissembled, as she'd so often done, even with those. The mild days shrank, a season ended. Nor so happy ever. In mid-December, a cold, steady rain began. Increasingly, the high-walled towers along the Corso shut out the daylight. Since I was a child. Then there had been terror in the night as now. She'd wake alone to find herself back in Nantasket, where she dreamed her mother dead, redreamed her best friend's body lying on hard sand until the waves reclaimed it, drowned. Brave metaphor of tides became lodged in that sullen dark, a heaving succubus of mud. The street corner flower vendors disappeared. Lamp lit all day, the stale cul-de-sac she could not leave now stank of charcoal and the chamber pot. Migraine, a vengeful ever since childhood doppelganger, returned with a new kind of nausea. The body so little of her life had ever found sweetness in, life for its own inexorable purposes took over. A strange, lilting, lean old maid, Carlyle had called her, though not nearly such a bore as he'd expected. What would Carlyle? What would straight-laced Horace Greeley? What would fastidious Nathaniel Hawthorne? What would all Concord, all New England, and her own mother say now? An actuality more fraught than any nightmare, terrors of the sea, of childbirth, the massive, slow, unending heave of human trouble. Injustice, ridicule. What did she do? It would be asked as though that mattered. Gave birth, lived through a revolution, nursed its wounded, saw it run aground, published a book or two, and drowned. The Nereids of Seraphos. This poem has an epigraph from uh, the Cyclades by J.T. Bent. Here Perseus left Donne, and when, after a successful voyage, he returned with Medusa's head and found King Polydectes making love to Donne, he forthwith turned him and all the Seraphiotes into stones. Sealed up in fright, the wedding party turned to rock. The way they used to tell it, one look at whatever the head-turning widow's son brought back from whatever place he'd gone, out west, or was it somewhere back east, they said, had done it. But pin anybody down, you find evasions, hearsay, a mere blur of allegation. And as for all that weathered clean economy, that fluted, pillared, clear-eyed residue of myth, listen a minute to the 19th century traveler. Of all the towns in the Greek islands, Seraphos will remain fixed in my mind as the most filthy. The main street is a sewer into which the, all the awful is thrown, and it is tenanted by countless pigs, for each householder has liberty to keep three. What the nuisance must have been when the number was unlimited, I cannot think. The mire, to climb out of the stink of pigsties, of privies, of the chamber pot upstairs, of soured milk, mildew, kerosene, the purgatorial Lysol. Yes, all this we know. 
Down there among said to be domesticated beasts, the boar, the fenced-in bull, green drool from bovine lips, green ooze of cowflops, that we are animals, mire-born, mud-cumbered, chilled, and full of fear, we know. The houses opening upon this street were black holes where sat families shivering round charcoal fires. The mire of Seraphos or of my own new providence, the terrors everybody knows about and no one speaks of. God, dying, getting caught. Telephone at midnight, fire, tornadoes, horse Poseidon, an old woman comes hobbling in, crossing herself, lest the stranger cast on her the evil eye. His query has to do with certain survivals of belief, in myriads to be precise. Closing her eyes, she mutters, groaning, I know nothing. It had all happened years ago, of course. Michael Capu Zacharias had been digging near the church. Here once again she vehemently crosses herself on what had been a very calm, still day, when suddenly a whirlwind came. They found him lying senseless, and in that state carried him home to his family. Of course, the 19th century traveler evinces no surprise. All one, those whirlwinds, nereids, harpies, whatever, such as carried off the daughter of Pandarius. Of course. But in landlocked New Providence, a place of fright as yet uncertified, Greek myth being merely Guido Rainey in a frame above the blackboard, at 4 p.m. or thereabouts on the 3rd of June in the year 1860, the meeting house was lifted from its foundation by a wind wrapped in a cloud, as an eyewitness, one A.M. Mulford, described it, of a dark purplish color, changing as it approached to a white mist so thick he could not see the fence some thirty feet away. Whereupon, he wrote, the wind began to blow with a fearful hollow roaring sound, which continued until the house was gone from over me, myself and children having gone to the cellar for safety. The storm continued so severe I could not stand on my feet, I should think, for two minutes, when it gradually decreased. No nereids, no gorgons, monstrous females with huge teeth like those of swine. Thus Bullfinch, 19th century burnisher of myth, who mentions an ingenious theory that the gorgons and the greae were only personifications of the terrors of the sea. Only. Only. Shipwreck, fear, death by water, whirlwind, water spout, tornado. No nereids, no harpies. Bullfinch, recycled to a tedious, sapless anthology. Guido Rainey, master of those who prettify, a rural in a frame above the blackboard. No mire, no stink, the pig tusked gorgon decertified, sealed up in fright of the unmentionable. Cancer, the lurid budding of the menses, having your underpants fall down in public. The epidemic that strikes down the young before the name of what it was is known. Exposure, rape, abortion, the mute gropings of the wedding night, locked up in fright. Fright locked in for life. Mere allegation. Headed west, they say. Or was it east? Nobody knows the story. Beach Glass While you walk the water's edge, turning over concepts I can't envision, the honking boy serves notice that at any time the wind may change. The reef bell clatters its treble monotone, deaf as Cassandra to any note but warning. The ocean, cumbered by no business more urgent than keeping open old accounts that never balanced, goes on shuffling its millenniums of quartz, granite, and basalt. It behaves toward the permutations of novelty, driftwood and shipwreck, Last night's beer cans, spilled oil, the coughed-up residue of plastic, with random impartiality, playing catch or tag or touch last like a terrier, turning the same thing over and over, over and over. For the ocean, nothing is beneath consideration. The houses of so many mussels and periwinkles have been abandoned here, it's hopeless to know which one to salvage. Instead, I keep a lookout for beach glass, amber of Budweiser, chrysoprase of Almadane and Gallo, lapis by way of no getting around it, I'm afraid, Philip's milk of magnesia, <laughs> with now and then a rare translucent turquoise or blurred amethyst of no known origin. The process goes on forever. They came from sand, 
they go back to gravel. Along with the treasuries of Murano, the buttressed astonishments of Chartres, which even now are readying for being turned over and over as gravely and gradually as an intellect engaged in the hazardous redefinition of structures no one has yet looked at. That poem was written on the coast of Maine. Um, I'm going to read another from the same place. It's called The August Darks, and the title came to me before the poem did, which doesn't often happen, but I saw a news story in the Ellsworth American, which is a kind of weekly Bible up there, about how the herring, the shoals of herring, cannot altogether be predicted, but it seemed as though they more often came in um, in the dark of the moon. Stealth of the flood tide, the moon dark but still at work, the herring shoals somewhere offshore looked for but not infallible as the tide is, as the August darks are. Stealth of the seep of daylight, the boats bird white above the inlets altering fish silver, the murmur of the motor as the first boat slips out ahead of daylight into the opening aorta, that heaving reckoning whose flux informs the heartbeat of the fisherman, poor, dark, fallible, infallible handful of a marvel, murmuring unasked inside the ribcage, workplace covert as the August darks are, as is the moon's work, masked within the, ma the blazing atrium of daylight, the margin of its dwindling, sanguine as with labor, but effortless, as is the image far out, illusory at the dark's edge of the cruise ship, moving seemingly unscathed by effort, bright as a stage set for the miming of the tiered swan's dance dying. The heartbeats, prodigies of strain unseen, the tendons ache, the blood-stained toe shoes, the tool sweat-stained, contained out where the herring wait, beyond the surf roar on the other side of silence, we should die of, George Eliot declared, were we to hear it. Many have already died of it. A landscape a little nearer by is the subject and the inspiration of the poem I'm going to read now. It's called The Dahlia Gardens, and I think the idea for it came to me originally from traveling between Washington and New York a number of times, and each time, especially at night, noticing the oil refineries at Marcus Hook. And they came to seem like something I didn't want to miss. They seemed to be a kind, kind of symbol of the country we live in. They remind me, as I pass them now, of a fact I discovered not too long ago that the first oil well ever drilled was drilled in 1859. Our entire culture rests on that discovery to a very large extent. Somehow, in my mind, the fact of hydrocarbon having so suddenly become so important uh, connected with an event that took place here in Washington in 1965. It was a self-immolation of a man named Norman Morrison, who has been largely forgotten in this country, although in Vietnam, I was told a few years back, he is still remembered. Um, there is an epigraph to this poem from Norman Mailer's Armies of the Night. It goes, there are places no history can reach. The Dahlia Gardens. Outside the river entrance, between the Potomac and the curbed flower beds, a man walks up and down, has been walking this last half hour. November leaves skip in the wind or are lifted unresisting to mesh with the spent residue of dahlias, late summer blood and flame. Leached marigolds, knives of gladioli flailed to ribbons. Parts of a system that seems on the face of it to be all waste, entropy, dismemberment, but which perhaps, given time enough, will prove to have refused nothing tangible. 
and jammed without audible clash with no more than a whiplash incident to its counterpart, a system shod in concrete, cushioned in butyl, riding chariots of thermodynamics, adept with the unrandom, the calculus of lifting and carrying with vectors, clocks, chronicles, calibrations. File clerks debouch into the dusk. It is rush hour. Headlights thicken a viscous chain along the Potomac from concentric corridors, five sides within five sides, grove leading on to grove, lit by autonomous purrings, daylight on demand, dense with the pristine, the dead white foliage of those archives that define and redefine with such precision, such subtleties of exactitude that only the honed mind's secret eye can verify or vouch for its existence. How the random is to be overcome, the unwelcome forestalled, the arcane calamity at once refused, delineated, and dwelt on. Where, as here, triune precaution, accumulation, and magnitude obtain, such levitations and such malignities have come with time to seem entirely natural. This conjuries being unquestionably the largest office building in Christendom. The man alone between blackened flower beds and the blackening Potomac moves with care, as though balanced astride the whiplash between system and system. Wearing an overcoat, hatless, thinning-haired, a man of seemingly mild demeanor who might have been a file clerk were it not for his habit of writing down notes to himself on odd scraps of paper, old bills, the backs of envelopes, or in a notebook he generally forgets to bring with him, and were it not for the wine jug he carries. The guard outside the river entrance as he pauses has observed it momentarily puzzled, cradled close against his overcoat. By now, file clerks, secretaries, minor and major bureaucrats, emerging massively through the several ports of egress, along the ramps, past the walled flower beds, which the lubrications and abrasions of routine, the multiple claims of a vigilant anxiety, the need for fine tuning, for continual readjustment of expectation, have rendered largely negligible flow around him. He moves against the flux toward the gardens. Around him, leaves skip in the wind like a heartbeat, like a skipped heartbeat. If I were a dead leaf, thou mightest bear. He shivers, cradling the wine jug, his heart beating strangely. His mind fills up with darkness. Overland, the inching caravans, the blacked out troop trains, convoys through ruined villages along the Mekong, merging with the hydrocarbon dark, headlight-inflamed Potomac, the little lights, the candles flickering on Christmas Eve, the one light left burning in a front hallway, kerosene-lit windows in the pitch dark of backcountry roads. His mind plunges like a derrick into that pitch dark as he uncorks the wine jug, and with a quick gesture, not unlike a signing of the cross, but he is a Quaker, begins the anointing of himself with its contents, with the ostensible domestic Rhine wine or Chablis, which is not wine, which in fact is gasoline. Tallow, rush light, whale oil, gas jet, black fat of the earth tortoise, siphoned from stone, a shale-tissued carapace, hydrocarbon, unearthed and peeled away process by process in stages not unlike the stages of revelation to a gaseous plume that blooms like a bush, a perpetual dahlia of incandescence midway between Wilmington and Philadelphia. Gaslight. And now these filamented avenues, wastelands and windrows of illumination, gargoyles, gasconades, buffooneries of neon, stockpiled incendiary pineapples, pomegranates of jellied gasoline that run along the ground, that cling in a blazing second skin to the skins of children. Anointing the overcoat, and underneath it the pullover with one elbow out, he sees below the whiplash threshold darkness boil up, a vat full of sludge, a tar pit, a motive force that is all noise, jet engines, rush hour aggressions, blast furnaces, headline-grabbing self-importances. 
the urge to engineer events, compel a change of government, a change of heart, a shift in the wind's direction, lust after mastery, manipulations of the merely political. Hermaphrodite of pity and violence, the chambered pistol and the sword-bearing archangel, scapegoat and self-appointed avenger, contend, embrace, are one. He strikes the match. A tiger leap, a singing envelope goes up, blue-wicked, a saffron overcoat of burning. In the forests of the night, make me thy lyre. Evolving out of passionless dismemberment, a nerveless parturition, green wheels meshed in recalibration with the sun. A random leaf, seized by the updraft, shrivels unresisting. Fragments of black ash drift toward the dahlia gardens. From dim tropisms of avoidance, articulated node upon internode into a scream, the unseen filament that never ends, that runs through all our chronicles, a manifesto flowering like a dahlia into whole gardens of astonishment, the sumptuous crimson, hearts dark, the piebald saffron and scarlet riding the dahlia gardens of the lake of Xochimilco, Benares, marigold garlanded sati, the burning ghats alongside the Ganges, at the Anquang Pagoda, saffron robes charring in fiery transparency, a bath of burning. Scraps of charred paper, another kind of foliage, drift toward the dahlia gardens. A leaf thou mightest bear. The extravaganza of a man of fire, having seized tiger-like the attention it now holds with the tenacity of napalm, of the homebound file clerks, secretaries, minor and major bureaucrats, superimposing upon multiple adjustments, the fine-tuning of precaution and accumulation, the demands of magnitude, what the concentric groves of those archives have no vocabulary for dwelling on. The uniform man of action, in whom precaution and the unerring em impulse are one, springs forward to pound and pummel, extinguishing the manifesto as decently as possible. Someone by now has sent for an ambulance. The headlights crawl, slowed by increasing density along the Potomac, along the diagonal thoroughfares, along the freeways, toward Baltimore, toward Richmond, toward Dulles and the Baltimore airport, the airborne engines alternating red and green, a pause and then again a red, a green, a waking fantasy upborne on a lagoon of hydrocarbon, as the Dahlia Gardens ride the lake of Xochimilco, while the voiceless processes of a system that in the end perhaps will have refused nothing tangible, continue neither to own nor altogether to refuse the burning filament that runs through all our chronicles, uniting system with system into one terrible mandala. The stripped hydrocarbon burns like a bush, a gaseous plume midway between Wilmington and Philadelphia. The landscape now shifts to my native Iowa. The poem I'm going to read is entitled Imago, and I perhaps should give you from my own notes the definition of that word from the American Heritage Dictionary, uh, definition one, an insect in its sexually mature adult stage after metamorphosis. Two, from psychoanalysis, an often idealized image of a person, usually a parent, formed in childhood and persisting into adulthood. It has also a couple of epigraphs. One is from Charles Olson's Call Me Ishmael, a book about Melville and about the sea, but also about America as a whole. The fulcrum of America is the plains, half sea, half land. And then from Glenway Westcott's Goodbye to Wisconsin, there is no Middle West. It is a certain climate, a certain landscape, and beyond that, a state of mind of people born where they do not like to live. <laughs> Imago. Sometimes, she remembers, a chipped flint would turn up in a furrow, pink as a peony from the iron in it or as the flared throat of a seashell, a nomad's artifact fished from the broth 
half sea, half land, hard evidence of an unfathomed state of mind. Nomads. The wagon train that camped and left its name on Mormon Ridge. The settlers who moved on to California, bequeathing a lap robe pieced from the hide of a dead buffalo, the frail sleigh that sleeps under the haymow, and a headstone so small it might be playing house for the infant daughter, age two days, no name, they also left behind. Half sea, half land, the shirker propped above her book in a farmhouse parlor lolls with the merfolk who revert to foam, eyeing at a distance the lit pavilions that seduced her, their tailed child, into the palaces of metamorphosis. She pays now, though they do not know this, by treading at every step she takes on a parterre of tomahawks. A thirst for something definite, so dense it feels like drowning. Grant Wood turned everything to cauliflower, the rounded contours of a thunderhead, flint hard. He made us proud, though all those edges might not be quite the way it was, at least he'd tried. But it has no form, they'd say to the scribbler whose floundering fragments kept getting out of hand, and who, either fed up with or starved out of her native sloughs, would, stowed aboard the usual nomadic moving van, trundle her dismantled sensibility elsewhere. Europe, that hodgepodge of ancestral calamities, was hard and handsome. It's rubble confident, not shriveling on the vine as here like an infertile melon, the virgin jejun in her grotto of cold plaster, half sick of that sidelong enclave, the whispered Catholic. Antiquity unshrouds on wimpling canvas, adjunct of schoolhouse make-believe, the Italy of urns and cypresses, of stairways evolving toward a state of mind not to be found except backstage among hunchbacks and the miscreants who control the scenery. Flanked by a pair of masks whose look at even this remove could drill through bone. The tragic howl, the comic rictus, eye holes that stare out of the crypt of what no grown-up has ever heard to speak of but in the strangled tone whose lexicon is summed up in one word, bankrupt. Bankrupt, the abysm of history, a slew to be pulled out of any way you could. Antiquity, the backward suction of the dark, amounted to a knot hole you plugged with straw, old rags, pages ripped from last year's Sears Roebuck catalog, anything to ward off the blizzard. Not so for the born again, the shuddering orifices of summer. On prayer meeting night, outside the vestibule, among multiple bell pulls of Virginia creeper, the terrible clepsydra of becoming distills its drop. A lunamoth, the emblem of the born again, furred like an orchid behind the ferned antennae, a totem garden of lascivious pheromones, hangs its glimmering streamers pierced by the dripstone burin of the eons with the predatory stare out of the burrow those same eye holes. Imago of unfathomable evolvings, living only to copulate and drop its litter. Does it know what it is, what it has been, what it may or must become? The next one was called Sunday Music. Behind it is uh, something I read of W.H. Auden some time ago. Um, to the effect that music represents our experience of time. Sunday music. The Baroque sewing machine of Georg Friedrich, going back, going back, to stitch back together scraps of a, a scheme that's outmoded, all those lopsidedly overblown expectations, now severely in need of revision, ray the nature of things, or more precisely, back a stitch, back a stitch, the nature of going forward. No longer footpath perpendicular, a monody tootled on antelope bone, no longer wheelbarrow heave ho, the nature of going forward is not perspective, not stairways, not as for the muse of Joscan or Jesualdo, Sostenuto, a leaning together in memory of, things held on to, fusing and converging. 
nor is it any longer an orbit, tonalities, fox and goose footprints going round and round in the snow, the centripetal force of the dominant. The nature of next is not what we seem to be hearing or imagine we feel, is not dance, is not melody, not elegy, is not even chemistry, not Mozart leaching out seraphs from a sieve of misfortune. The nature of next is not fugue or rondo, not footpath or wheelbarrow track, not steamship's base vibrations, but less and less knowing what to expect. It's the rate of historical change going faster and faster. It's noise. It's droids, stone-deaf intergalactic Twitter. It's get ready to disconnect, no matter how filled our heads are with backed-up old tunes, with polyphony, with basso profundo fioratura, with this concerto grosso's delectable bacasich, bacasich, allegro. I'm going to conclude uh, with another poem about music, Beethoven, Opus 111. It has an epigraph from a prose essay by the uh, Russian poet Asaph Mandelstam. There are epochs when mankind, not content with the present, longing for time's deeper layers, like the plowman thirsts for the virgin soil of time. Or conversely, hungers for the levitations of the concert hall, the hands like rafts of putti out of a region where the dolorous stars are fixed in glassy ceremonies of art, the ancien regime's diaphanous plash athwart the mounting throb of hobnails, shod squadrons of vibration mining the air, its struck oars hardening into a plowshare, a downward wandering disrupting every formal symmetry. From the supine harp case, the strung foot tendons under the mahogany, the bulldozer in the base unearths a Pyrenaean catacomb. Beethoven ventilating for the sound he cannot hear, the cave-in of recurring rage. In the tornado country of mid-America, my father might have been his twin, a farmer hacking at sour dock at the strangle roots of thistles and wild morning glories setting out rashly one October to rid the fence rows of poison ivy. Livid seed globs turreted in trinities of glitter, ripe with the malefic glee no farmer doubts lives deep down things. My father was naive enough, by nature revolutionary, though he'd have disowned the label, to suppose he might in some way, minor but radical, disrupt the givens of existence, set his neighbors thinking straight undo the stranglehold of reasons nations send their boys off to war. That fall, after the oily fireworks had cooled down to trellises of hairy wicks, he dug them up, rootstocks and all, and burned them. Do gooder. The well-meant holocaust became a mist of venom, sewing itself along the sculptured hollows of his overalls, bracelet wrists and collarbone a mesh of blisters spreading to a shirt worn like a curse. For weeks, he writhed inside it, awful. High art with a stiff neck, an upright Steinway bought in Chicago, a chromo of a Habama tree avenue or of Malay's imagined peasant, the lark she listens to, invisible, perhaps irrelevant, Harp strings and fripperies of air congealed into an object nailed against the wall, its sole ironic function, if it has any, to demonstrate that one, though he may grunt and sweat at work, is not a clod. Beethoven might declare the air his domicile, the wind's kin, the tornado a kind of second cousin. Here his labor merely shimmers, a deracinated album leaf, a bagatelle, the moonlight rendered with a dying fall. The chords subside, disintegrate, regroup in climbing sequences, con brio. There is no dwelling on the sweet past here, there being no past to speak of other than the setbacks. Typhoid in the wells, half the first settlers dead of it before a year was out. Diphtheria and scarlet fever every winter. Drought, the depression, a mortgage on the mortgage. High art as a suzurus, the silk and perfume of unsullied hands.
those hands, driving the impressionable wild with anguish for another life entirely, the ly Lyceum circuit, the doomed diving bell of art. Beethoven in his workroom, ear trumpet, conversation book and pencil, candlestick, broken crockery, the Graf piano wrecked by repeated efforts to hear himself. Out of a humdrum squalor, the levitations, the shakes and triplets, the adagio molto semplice e cantabile, the arietta, a disintegrating surf of blossom opening along the keyboard, along the fence rows, the astonishment of sweetness. My father driving somewhere in Kansas or Colorado, in Dust Bowl country, stopped a car to dig up by the roots a flower he'd never seen before, a kind of prickly poppy, most likely, its luminousness wounding the blank plains like desire. He mentioned in a letter the disappointment of his having hoped it might transplant, an episode that brings me near tears still, as even his dying does not, that awful dying, months long, hunkered, irascible from a clod no plowshare could deliver, a groan for someone because he didn't want to look at anything to take away the flowers, a bawling as of slaughterhouses, slogans of a general uprising, Freiheit. Beethoven, shut up with the four walls of his deafness, rehearsing the unhearable semplice e cantabile, somehow reconstituting the blister shirt of the intolerable into these shakes and triplets, a hurrying into flowering along the fence rows. Dying for my father came to be like that, finally. In its messages, the levitation of serenity, as though the spirit might aspire in its last act to walk on. <laughs>